Your Excellences, distinguished guests, friends of the University of Oslo. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the University of to the University of Avla after an emotional weekend. Most of you followed yesterday's strong Nobel Peace Prize ceremony. It was touching to hear award winner Setsko Turlo testify about her own experiences on August 6, 1945, about losing close family. As a 13-year-old watching humans suffering closely, how the radiation affected both those that experienced radiation directly and the generations that followed. A strong and clear time witness. We need time witnesses. And this aula and the neighboring festival has frequently been used to witness both past and present. This fall, on September 1st, Yasmin Barrios received an honorary doctorate at this stage. Barrios fight corruption, organized crime, and drug trafficking, as well as the many human rights violations that occurred during Guatemala's 36-year civil war. On November 13th, Ishtar Gösaydin received the University of Oslo Human Rights Prize. A Turkish academic and human rights campaigner, she was not allowed to travel to to, from Turkey, but was present by escape, Skype, giving strong evidence of the situation in Turkey today. On November 26th, Gerd Golombek and Leif Grust witnessed about the situation in Norway 75 years earlier, a day when 529 Jews were deported from Oslo, transported by the ship Donau, and later sent on to Auschwitz. Last Saturday, December 9th, we met a delegation with survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki in our botanical gardens. They brought seeds from trees that survived the atomic bomb in 45. Seeds that symbolize survival power and hope. Today, we are again assembled here in this splendid aula, a place that has been of large importance to the cultural and intellectual life in Norway since it was inaugurated in 1911. It has been, and still is, a central meeting place in Norwegian cultural and public life. And in fact, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded in this very hall from 1947 until 1989. We are pleased that the University of Oslo can serve society by cooperating across sectors and by being an arena for dialogue. Academia's role in society is to encourage deeper understanding, critical thinking, and free speech, which is why dialogue indeed is so important. I'm looking forward to the new Nobel Peace Prize Forum here today across dividing lines, and I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the De Nobel Institute for the cooperation, and I will now give the word to Nobel Institute's director, Olaf Njölstad. Please. Good morning. <clears throat> this year's Nobel Peace Prize Forum Oslo, across dividing lines, will address indigenous people's rights within the context of social justice and environmental protection. It is indeed a timely issue. First, 2017 marks both the 20th anniversary or the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the 25th anniversary of Dr. Rigoberta Menchu receiving the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of her work for peace and reconciliation across ethnic, cultural and social dividing lines. Still, 25 years later, across today's world, the rights of indigenous peoples are frequently being challenged, disputed, neglected. This is why the organizers of the forum 
has decided to invite Dr. Rigoberta Menchu back to Oslo to reflect upon the state of affairs concerning indigenous rights 25 years after her Nobel Peace Prize award. What progress has been made? And what are the unsolved issues and pressing challenges ahead? Immediately following Dr. Manchu's talk, a six-member panel will discuss the Standing Rock conflict in North Dakota, where oil pipeline interests have clashed with the rights of the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota peoples, and compare it to some extent with the Nusir copper mine controversy in the municipality of Kvalsun in northern Norway, a conflict affecting the indigenous Sami population of the region. The panel discussion will be moderated by Fred Duzam Lazaro, highly respected correspondent for PBS NewsHour one of the most trusted news broadcasts in the United States. As this theme across dividing lines suggests, this year's Nobel Peace Prize Forum Oslo is intended not only to shed light upon the conflicts and interests at stakes in these conflicts, but also to provide a platform for dialogue and experience sharing. sharing. On behalf of the Nobel Institute, I would like to express my gratitude to our partner, the University of Oslo, and to our sponsors and event partners, New Generation Power and Peace Through Commerce for their generous support. But now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce one of the great champions for indigenous, indigenous people's rights over the last 30 years, and Nobel Peace Prize laureate of 1992, Dr. Rigoberta Menchu. Please take the floor. Thank you. Good morning. Es uh, un placer estar aquí en Oslo eh, celebrando este gran día. En nuestro sagrado calendario maya, este día nos recuerda que han pasado en este planeta millones y millones de ancestros, abuelos y abuelas, generaciones y muchas generaciones. Y lo que nos recuerda es que somos apenas una generación y que el día de mañana seremos también abuelos y abuelas de este planeta. Por lo tanto, Nuestros abuelos nos recuerdan que tenemos que dejar un camino para las nuevas generaciones para que continúe su vida plena. Los abuelos y las abuelas nos han permitido eh, tener abuelas, abuela agua, abuela animal, abuelos abuelos, plantas, los abuelos que nos dan vida en este planeta. No sé si todos tienen eh, audífono. Do you have interpreter? Ya. Yeah? Ok. <laughs> Damos tiempo para que pongan sus audífonos, ¿sí? Yo quiero expresar mi profunda gratitud, especialmente al Instituto Nobel y al Comité Nobel por la invitación. Es un gran homenaje a los pueblos indígenas. 
Es un gran homenaje a un premio Nobel que recibimos hace 25 años. Y en esos 25 años, efectivamente, han pasado muchos acontecimientos. Acontecimientos que, por un lado, nos permite visualizar los avances, especialmente los avances en materia de derechos de pueblos indígenas. Dio mucho resultado el trabajo de nuestros hermanos y hermanas en el Grupo de Trabajo sobre Poblaciones Indígenas de la ONU, en la Conferencia Mundial de Viena, dio mucho resultado eh, la participación de nuestros hermanos en la Asamblea General de Nueva York, donde se creó el Foro Permanente de los Pueblos Indígenas. También podemos recordar el Convenio 169 podemos recordar las décadas internacionales de pueblos indígenas que ha dado una agenda especial para los pueblos indígenas y los gobiernos. Hemos visto en los últimos años debate, mucho debate internacional sobre los pueblos indígenas y eso es muy positivo porque hace 25 años no teníamos estos instrumentos internacionales, no teníamos un relator especial sobre pueblos indígenas y no teníamos reuniones o cumbres adentro de las Naciones Unidas. Pero también hace 25 años estábamos discutiendo si adentro de los acuerdos de paz especialmente acuerdos de paz en Guatemala, se incorporaba los temas de derechos, identidad de los pueblos indígenas. Y después de mucho debate se logran también algunos acuerdos de paz que hacen un énfasis especial a los pueblos indígenas. De tal manera que si hablamos de derechos indígenas, podríamos empezar las referencias en el campo internacional, en las Naciones Unidas en particular y en algunos escenarios de la Organización de Estados Americanos. Pero también podemos ver en la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos que hay un conjunto de resoluciones dictaminadas sobre pueblos indígenas. Especialmente si hablamos de derechos territoriales o que los efectos de políticas extractivas que afectaron a los pueblos indígenas hoy están en la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. Se está discutiendo en el seno de la Organización de Estados Americanos la Convención Americana sobre Derechos de Pueblos Indígenas. Nosotros somos parte de esas dinámicas. Hace 25 años solamente empezaba a arrancar el Convenio 169 y hoy vemos un conjunto de instrumentos que es producto de debate, que es producto de discusión y esto es muy positivo. También a nivel nacional hay muchos avances sobre todo lo que se refiere a los derechos específicos de los pueblos indígenas. En el caso de Guatemala, logramos que los 23 idiomas mayenses se convierte en idioma oficial. Ante la ley, somos 23 idiomas mayenses. Se han creado varias instituciones como mecanismos para que vigile la participación de los pueblos indígenas. O sea, hay un punto importante de definición, de agenda legislativa, de agenda de las instituciones internacionales, los enfoques. Yo recuerdo en estos días, eh, realmente había un enfoque también en los, um, 
los planes que hacían las Naciones Unidas para el desarrollo integral. Esto implica la participación de los pueblos indígenas. Vemos entonces un conjunto de instrumentos. Ahora, vamos a otro ángulo de la realidad. En estos últimos 25 años hay un porcentaje de idiomas indígenas que ya se han perdido, que ya no se van a hablar, porque nunca tuvieron la oportunidad de desarrollar sus lenguas. En estos 25 años vemos un porcentaje de las tierras ancestrales que también se han perdido. Muchos de ellos son resultado del despojo, de la discriminación. Muchos de ellos son resultado precisamente la falta de políticas públicas donde hay pueblos indígenas. Hay un avance internacional importantísimo, pero hay una realidad nacional dramático, eh, preocupante, porque muchos de los pueblos indígenas también poco a poco abandonan su, sus tierras y pierden la conexión con una gran civilización ancestral. Algunos casos son despojos de tierras, otros es la falta de trabajo o de vida digna de los pueblos indígenas en las áreas especialmente urbanas. Vemos una gran brecha entre la definición de derechos de pueblos indígenas y el cumplimiento de políticas públicas que beneficien a los pueblos indígenas. El centro de los problemas, por lo menos en toda América Latina, es la tierra. Sigue siendo la tierra el problema fundamental. Por un lado, los estados no otorgaron títulos de propiedad asegurada a las comunidades indígenas. Y por otro lado, también la extracción de los bienes naturales de los pueblos indígenas causa nuevos escenarios de conflictos especialmente el choque con algunas transnacionales que explotan de manera irresponsable la madre tierra. En esto hay países más que otros. En el caso Guatemala, yo sigo viendo como el mayor problema de los próximos años la tierra, la extracción minera, y especialmente porque las comunidades no tienen beneficio de ese desarrollo que se plantea en sus comunidades o en su país. Tenemos el grave problema que la mayor cantidad de los recursos que los estados asignan para la educación bilingüe intercultural muchas veces se queda en la corrupción. Y la corrupción no hace posible que llegue a los pueblos indígenas. O sea, si vemos por un lado los derechos de los pueblos indígenas en la vida cotidiana, hay grandes desafíos que enfrentar, hay grandes dificultades, hay grandes abusos y sobre todo continúa en muchos casos la criminalización de los dirigentes indígenas. Pero por otro lado, vemos que hay instrumentos. ¿Qué es lo que tenemos que hacer? Probablemente revitalizar una agenda nueva para los próximos años. Especialmente encontrar los mecanismos de aplicación de las normas con las políticas públicas de los estados y la participación plena, activa, y propositiva de los pueblos indígenas. Demanda que lo hemos venido trayendo durante las últimas tres décadas en particular, donde hemos, hemos querido que se construyera una ruta compartida entre los estados establecidos y las comunidades indígenas y sus dirigentes. 
Efectivamente, el convenio 169 ha sido uno de los convenios más invocados en los pueblos indígenas en los últimos 25 años. En algunos países se tuvo que luchar para que se oficialice la aplicación del convenio 169 de manera constitucional en nuestros países. En otros, definitivamente el convenio 169 se convirtió en un instrumento apropiado por los pueblos indígenas y realicen bajo el convenio una serie de consultas en la población. Estas consultas muchas veces no son vinculantes con el sistema legal, sin embargo, son consultas que legitima la participación de los pueblos indígenas. En el caso de Guatemala, hemos hecho 72 consultas populares bajo el Convenio 169, donde la inmensa mayoría de la población vota junto con los alcaldes, junto con la autoridad local, votan a favor de la consulta informada y plena, pero también vota a favor de la no extracción de la minería con eh, métodos que lastima la madre tierra o que destruye la vida con químicos, con otro tipo de minerales que no significa el desarrollo para los pueblos indígenas. Hemos querido encontrar modelos, por ejemplo, en cuanto a la, la utilización de desarrollo eléctrica, pero muchos de las, los modelos que tenemos es que pasa la luz cerca de la comunidad, pero no hay luz para la comunidad. Entonces la gente no ve esto como una alternativa. Por eso es que muchas veces las confrontaciones son cada vez mayores. Pero yo soy una mujer más optimista. Yo creo que si hace 25 años no teníamos la Declaración de Principios Universales de Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas, no teníamos la experiencia que significa el foro permanente en las Naciones Unidas, tampoco teníamos la oportunidad de un relator especial y no teníamos la participación directa de los pueblos indígenas en muchas mesas de negociaciones, hoy las tenemos, entonces podemos sacar mejor provecho para las futuras generaciones. Definitivamente somos una generación que nos tocó la Guerra Fría, que nos tocó la violencia más cruel en nuestras familias, en nuestros hogares. Y que hoy hay muchas posibilidades del que no vayamos a permitir ese tipo de violencia en nuestras comunidades. Pero yo veo más experiencia en América Latina porque los pueblos indígenas también han sido parte de lo convulso, lo convulso que han sido las decisiones políticas en nuestra región. Y sin duda hay un conjunto de liderazgo indígena que hoy está asumiendo su determinación. Esperamos venir a este foro también a hacer un llamado a la comunidad internacional para que siga respaldando los dirigentes indígenas donde quiera que estén haciendo una lucha por sus derechos. Es necesario respaldar el trabajo de los dirigentes indígenas, hombres y mujeres, porque su batalla no es otro más que complementar una ruta hacia el futuro. En estos 25 años yo he constatado que el Premio Nobel de la Paz para nosotros fue un reconocimiento profundo a los derechos, la lucha, la tenacidad de los pueblos indígenas. Significa un reconocimiento a los pueblos indígenas donde quiera que estén. 
también significa un reconocimiento a su grandeza, su pensamiento, su tecnología, sus aportes a la humanidad, un respaldo al futuro de las esperanzas, del dolor y del sufrimiento de los propios pueblos indígenas. El premio Nobel también representó un golpe rotundo al racismo y la discriminación. En todas partes, el premio Nobel volcó la mirada hacia los pueblos indígenas. No Rigoberta Menchú, sino la memoria colectiva de los pueblos indígenas. Y por eso nos sentimos orgullosos de este premio, porque creemos que sentó un precedente histórico que enaltece la voz de los pueblos indígenas, la mirada del mundo hacia los pueblos indígenas y también la preocupación de las Naciones Unidas para encontrar estos mecanismos que ya hemos mencionado. Para los próximos años, los pueblos indígenas siguen necesitando hacer una agenda compartida entre las Naciones Unidas, la comunidad internacional y los pueblos indígenas. Yo quiero rendir homenaje a la cooperación noruega. Los países nórdicos han, sido, han estado muy presentes en todos los procesos que hemos llevado. Eh, me consta que en América Latina, en Guatemala, nuestros avances es gracias a la cooperación de los países nórdicos. Suecia, en particular, ha invertido mucho esfuerzo en acompañar la lucha de los pueblos indígenas y Noruega. Esperamos que Noruega siga siendo la cuna de un rayo de sol para los pueblos indígenas del planeta. El reconocimiento de sus dirigentes y el acompañamiento de sus luchas incansables. También queremos rendir homenaje al ejemplo increíble que significa el Premio Nobel para el apoyo de la lucha de las mujeres. Nosotras las mujeres hemos tenido una tremenda participación en diversos campos y gracias a este espacio y a esta tarima. Queremos poner en el centro de este foro a nuestros jóvenes, porque los jóvenes no solo necesitan la tierra, no solo necesitan eh, la participación plena, sino también necesitan de los conocimientos, necesitan profundizar un liderazgo, un liderazgo para la paz, porque son nuestros sustitutos. Estos tres puntos me parece a mí fundamental para este foro. El reconocimiento de los instrumentos, el reconocimiento de una realidad impactante de los pueblos indígenas que siguen viviendo en el silencio y el reconocimiento de nuestra juventud hacia el futuro. Nos hemos sentido acompañado con todas las luchas de todos los pueblos indígenas y por eso rindo homenaje a nuestros hermanos que trabajaron incansablemente en los últimos 25 años. Hemos logrado también un nivel de participación política y ese nivel de participación política es un ejemplo de que es posible encontrar una ruta común con todos los seres humanos del planeta, pero en particular con nuestros conciudadanos donde permanecemos y vivimos todos los días. La educación. La educación para la paz es otra de nuestras demandas. Queremos que los pueblos indígenas también garanticen su propia paz, su propia armonía, basada en el legado más profundo que nos dejaron nuestros ancestros, que es la plenitud de la vida. Y luchamos por esa plenitud de la vida. Gracias a todos los amigos que yo veo que están aquí presentes, gracias a ustedes también que el éxito de la agenda indígena 
es una realidad. A pesar de las limitaciones, a pesar de los problemas que tenemos, hay un éxito, hay un ejemplo y hay una guía que seguir para el futuro. Yo deseo para este foro las mejores conclusiones y que haya un seguimiento. Venimos a buscar una agenda consecutiva y yo creo que es posible que podamos seguir haciendo intercambios. Sobre todo, mucho pueden decir nuestras organizaciones y nuestras autoridades ancestrales. En muchos países, las autoridades ancestrales han fortalecido su participación y han fortalecido la enseñanza hacia sus nuevas generaciones. Eso es lo que nos hace posible estar aquí. Pues que vivan las culturas del mundo, que vivan las civilizaciones ancestrales, que vivan nuestros idiomas y que viva nuestra relación humana fraterna y armoniosa con nuestra madre naturaleza. Como empezaba hoy, nuestro sagrado día nos recuerda que somos apenas unas generaciones viviendo este planeta y depende de nosotros qué tipo de planeta también dejamos a las generaciones futuras. Y qué mejor si desde ahora empecemos a trabajar nuestro relevo. Muchos me han preguntado en estos 25 años por qué no hay otro indígena recibiendo el premio Nobel. Y yo he dicho probablemente no hemos inscrito una candidatura. Y muchas gracias al Instituto Nobel y al Comité Nobel por esta oportunidad de después de recibir un premio Nobel eh, que exige la abolición de las armas nucleares, un foro sobre pueblos indígenas. Y a mí me parece que esto es una manera también de enaltecer la lucha y el reconocimiento a los pueblos indígenas. Muchas gracias Noruega por su cariño, su amor. Ustedes apenas son casi 6 millones de habitantes de este planeta. Y sin embargo, ustedes a través de la memoria de don Alfredo Nobel han hecho una gran contribución a la armonía universal y que sigan con esa contribución a la armonía universal. Muchas gracias. We would like to invite our panelists to kindly take their seats. And we'd also like to invite up to the podium here Elder Tim Mentz to uh, lead, us, lead us in a brief prayer. Is he here? I want to offer something that uh, 
is going to take you back to my homeland, uh, the indigenous nations of the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota. And through that sharing of heart, we offer prayer that the Great Spirit will listen to us, that he will have pity on us. And the things that we're going to talk about today, I'm going to touch back on my homeland of Cannonball, North Dakota, on the Standing Rock Reservation. So my relatives asked me to offer this, and I, I offer it in great humbleness to the Samis, indigenous people of, of this land, of all the indigenous people that are within this great halls here, but also to my relatives. I want to say it in my way also. So I ask for forgiveness if you don't understand what I'm offering it through my heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for the invitation to be here, Olav. Thank you, Dr. Menchu. So many notable people here, so many notable people here, so little time. So I will abbreviate or actually skip most of the formal introductions if you need to know more about our panelists. There's abundant material on the internet, or perhaps there's enough in your, in your brochures. I was asked to begin with a few words of background to guide our discussion today, trying to narrow a vast, vast topic that dates back centuries. And I started to wonder on my first visit to Norway from where I live in Minnesota, what might have happened if Christopher Columbus had managed somehow to consult with Leif Erikson. It might have pointed him in a different direction because he was looking for Indians from my homeland. He wound up in the wrong hemisphere and found some different people that he called Indians anyway. And it was the start of a yawning divide between indigenous communities and the nation states that emerged on their lands. And it's a divide, of course, that is not restricted to the new world, as, as we'll discuss later today. Today, we'll visit two very distinct theaters in this divide to see if there are lessons to be learned, one from the other, or just globally. And for those of you not familiar, I will add just a paragraph each on the two cases that we're going to be talking about today, from which we have several of the principles. The Dakota Access Pipeline straddles four states from the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota to Illinois. 
for policymakers who support it. The project has created thousands of construction jobs, about 40 permanent ones, and fits with the goal of U.S. energy independence. Construction of this pipeline was slowed for months and years by protesters from the Standing Rock Lakota community and hundreds of sympathizers protesting a pipeline that came very, very close to the main water supply source of this community and protesting as well the decimation of many sacred sites and artifacts. The resistance often met with a harsh crackdown, and at least one of our panelists can attest to that firsthand. Things seesawed through the court and regulatory systems until they screeched to a very abrupt halt after November's election. Oil began flowing through that pipe in June. The other case takes us to the northern Finnmark region of Norway, where the Nusir company, as Olaf mentioned, is pr proposing a copper mine on lands inhabited by the Sami people. The Sami parliament has opposed the project, concerned about the impact on reindeer husbandry, a traditional Sami occupation. There are also environmental concerns about the plan to bury mine wastes in a fjord that's critical to salmon fisheries. This project has also seesawed for years between a Norwegian uh, government that has largely approved it and the regional fin Finnmark Council, which sees it as an economic stimulus for a region that needs one, but continued opposition from the Sami parliament. More deliberations are likely. So let's go to our panel, which is not representative of all sides of the conflict. The organizers told me this is just not practical or possible for a number of reasons. And in any event, the purpose here is not to relitigate these cases in each of the disputes, even though our panelists hardly agree with one another in many cases, but rather in pursuit of crossing the divide. I want to go first to Grand Chief Edward John of the Lasden community in Canada. You've worked globally with the United Nations in forging indi indigenous rights to self-determination. It would seem that the ground reality, the economic imperatives, are just simply overwhelming in such cases. And the outcome, pretty much the same, whether it's in the US or in Norway, which have very different systems. So I have a two-part question to start us out. Where do you see hope for self-determination? And specifically, what is it that indigenous communities are specifically seeking as the outcome in cases such as this? Thank, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, your highnesses and all friends here, to my fellow panelists, I want to thank my sister, Rigoberta, uh, for the beautiful words that she shared with us today. And I think she laid for us a very important groundwork and what you did 25 years ago and, and today as well. Um, I want to acknowledge your son's 23rd birthday today, Mash. Congratulations. So Rigoberta talked about our youth, and there's a young lady, her name is Anna here. She's the, the chief's personal assistant today. She volunteered. We're talking about our youth and how important we hold them up and we cherish them, and the future belongs to them. As we wind our way through, through our own respective lives, and, and so today I want to say that I am from Canada, um, where hockey is uh, king or queen. Um, and I do know about Matt Zuccarello from this land here. A very good hockey player playing for the wrong team, the New York Rangers. He should be playing for Vancouver. Our sister brought up the issue of indigenous languages, and she is right. The United Nations uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon said every Every week to two weeks, one indigenous language dies. And that's, that's a very hard fact to, to undertake. In, in the country where I come from, 
Um, our language is for, forbidden. Our children, including myself, were removed from our families, from our communities, from our lands, from our elders. We were brought into these institutions called Indian residential schools, uh, and uh, we were to be assimilated. We were supposed to be the instruments of our own demise, that we were to be assimilated. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which concluded its final report in 2015 in Canada, came to one fundamental truth, one fundamental conclusion, that Canada's laws, policies, practices amounted to cultural genocide. This is in a, in a developed country. But that's a history of the last 150 years. I'll come back to that in, in terms of the hope. Crossing, crossing the divide, the divide, firstly, is historical. It is very deep. As my sister Rigoberta mentioned, it's marred with assimilation, it's marked with colonialism, it's marked with massacres, it's marked with genocide, it's marked with slavery. And we, it is our history, we've lived through that. And today, the implications of the historical relationships uh, remain. And so we find our communities in a very dire situation where social economic disparities are very deep compared to the rest of the population. So we're, we are working to find and to work on solutions. So we're, we're looking at this divide. I was honored to witness the ceremonies yesterday because there, there was discussion about another divide between humanity and states, between states themselves. In the situation of indigenous peoples, we're talking about the, the divide between the state and indigenous peoples. So there are similarities. The, the UN, UN, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948 um, was in response to some serious human rights violations. And so in 19, 2007, 70 years later, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was adopted, and it's a framework for building peace, building relationships. And so I want to give an example of Canada, where when the United Nations Declaration was completed at the Human Rights Council in Geneva in 2006, the 48 member states voted and Canada was a member then, and Canada voted no along with Rus the Russian Federation. I was there, I was, I was heartbroken. And so it went to New York in 2007. The United Nations General Assembly voted again, and the board at the General Assembly turned green. There were four red dots. United States, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada voted no. And we were heartbroken again that our own country would have voted no, that these were developed states with relationships with indigenous peoples. So we went to work back in Canada. Today, Canada has adopted under this new government the U United Nations Declaration without qualifications. And now there is a bill before the House of Commons to, to give life to the bill, to the, um, to the declaration by legislation. And so we find ourselves in a place of optimism that we will begin to address the disparities that, that do exist. The biggest conflict we find are in relation to the rights to self-determination in Article 3 of the Declaration and the rights to lands, territories, and resources from Articles 26 to 32 and the, I, the concept of free, prior, informed consent where there is development to happen in our respective territories. So I had the honor of visiting my sister's territories last year, a year ago, and did a report for the United Nations Permanent Forum and what I witnessed, and she's in a way better position than I am to tell that story. So I wanted to, to, to lay out uh, that framework that the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a centerpiece now for all Indigenous Peoples. We work to over 27 years to get that declaration in place. It is also ours, we cherish it, and we want the states to work with us to implement it. The United Nations, United Nations has developed a, has a system-wide action plan 
where the declaration is embedded in the Paris Agreement, Sustainable Development 20 plus 30 goals. Um, and, but there's a slow in the uptake at the state level, at the country level. And so maybe I will leave it at, at that point. Thank you, uh, Fred. Great. We'll come back to the second part of my question because I think that's going to be a theme, which is specifically what outcomes are indigenous communities seeking. But you've, you've set the, the broad sort of agenda for us today talking about having a framework in place to acknowledge self-determination. The devil is in the details and the implementation, which is going to be another theme. Mm -hmm. And the United States did come around to signing, signing after initially saying no. But it didn't seem to matter to you, Holy Elk um, Lafferty. You were on the front lines in the Dakota Access Pipeline controversy. You were at Standing Rock. Uh, and you have the bruises, physical and otherwise, to show for it. And I'm just wondering, now that, you know, essentially oil is flowing, um, where do you go from here and what energizes you to continue where you're going? Is, it's not all over, I assume. Where do you go from here? Tell us what all of the chief just told matters when it comes to put, you know, it, it didn't seem to matter. My name is Holy Elk Lafferty. I am Minikoju Oglala and Sichangu Lakota. I am of the Ocheti Shakoni Sacred Fires. I am very honored to be here today and I and I'm grateful that, that you're all here to, to hear the words that we're speaking and the stories that we have to share. I am one of over 800 people who were brutalized and arrested during the Standing Rock resistance. And I am one of thousands of others who, who just stood together, who were able to listen and, and heed the call of our hearts to unity. We heard the cry of the earth, of the water, and we decided that we were willing to put everything else aside because we want life for the water, we want life for the earth, we want life for our future generations. Um, so back to the, the question here, um, if you could redirect me. <laughs> what gives you the, the hope that propels you? In this battle, it would seem to the outside world, was lost if what we were trying to do was redirect that pipeline. Uh, it is where it was intended to be. Definitely. But you, but you have no intention to move on with different pursuits of your life. This is a very central concern. What gives you hope that will continue to, to, to propel you forward? What gives, what gives me hope is that um, I am one of so many people we have endured over 500 years of genocide, our, our preceding generations have experienced so much trauma. The government has come, they have stolen our children, they have stolen, attempted to steal our culture, they have stolen our language, they have tried to kill the Indian in us. We have lived through generations of hopeless situations where other people on the outside looking in w would think that we're insane for having hope, that we continue to carry on. I, I can't explain to you why or how, but this is just the way that we're made. As indigenous people, I can say, you know, as the women of, in, of, of the nations, you know, when we have our, we see our children that are afraid, that are, that are fearful, we're afraid too. But we dig deep and we find that hope, we find a way to provide inspiration for our people to continue to carry forward the fight that we have no other option. We are the life givers, we are the protectors of, of the life for our, our children and our grandchildren and all future generations. So there is no other way but to find hope. 
Um, so, so for me, it, it's it's a way of being. It's you know, it's a way that it's just the way that we are. We, it's who we are to find hope. Is there a spiritual basis to that? And can you talk a little bit about? Yeah, that definitely. So? Um, so, so right now, at this moment in, in history, we are living prophecies being fulfilled. We have. Um, been told, have had these teachings passed down in our tribes, in our communities, in our circles, and, you know, we may not share all of the details of those prophecies. A lot of them are known pretty publicly, but, you know, there are other parts that, as Indigenous people, we have to, you know, protect the sacredness of those things, but we are living right now the prophecies that have been foretold, and I believe that each of us that are alive on this earth at this moment in time, we're here for a reason. We are all a part of this prophecy. We all have a responsibility to stand up, to have courage, and to just do our part in this big story of evolution. Um, the earth is suffering, the water is suffering, our people have suffered for so long. But I believe that we are in a time now that we have the opportunity for change. And, and this has all been, this is all bigger than us. It's bigger than any of us humans. So, you know, I, I stand just as a servant to this prophecy to, to do what my, I'm responsible for as a Lakota woman. And I see all of my brothers and sisters globally doing the same thing. Stephanie Hope Smith, you offered your services as a conduit, if you will, a, a go-between. You have seen the pain, the divide, the deficit in trust, the fact that communities that live very close to one another are very foreign to one another on either side of this divide. What tools did you bring and what were your goals in the work that you did in this, in this particular you know, Dakota Pipeline controversy? Well, good morning to everyone and to um, what a distinguished group of people in the room today. So I, I greet you also. Um, my name is Stephanie and I speak as myself. Um, I don't represent any organization. I am not a government employee. I am clearly not indigenous. But what I've discovered in my spirit is that there is a place for people who can come in and be neutral. Um, it doesn't mean that their heart is neutral because mine is not but to choose to be neutral in a moment, to hopefully bring people together, to work through questions. Um, often that role is holding up a mirror and saying this is what I think I heard you say is, and to ask some clarification. Sometimes it's asking a question three or four different ways um, and trying to um, allow those in the room to truly hear it. So I wanna speak more about just the role of mediation um, and that is a hope for mine, that there are others um, who will choose to engage as invited. Um, I was invited by Chief Arvo Looking Horse to serve in this capacity um, many years ago and started in 2007. What I saw for the first time as a white woman with definite privilege moving to a different state, to a, a territory that was clearly Dakota, and, uh, and these indigenous people, and I didn't know anything about the land. Part of that is learning about the people's land that you're living on um, and, uh, and, and trying to do the best you can to walk lightly with our environment. And um, I recognize that it is not my role um, and it is not my position nor my goal to try to fix anything. Um, in mediation, it is not like arbitration or going through the court system where you have a judge who makes a decision or an arbitration where you bring the parties together and then there's a, a statement that's made and everybody lives with it. Mediation is, a, is an art of dialogue and bringing people together to try to find a space for how do we move this forward. But this is probably the most important thing that I've learned uh, in the last 10 years is that peace is not the goal. I believe that peace without justice is unsustainable. 
And so often people come in as peacemakers, peace builders, and they want to fix the moment, and they will not address the hundreds of years or whatever the issues are behind the scenes. Um, the players are not at the table to speak for themselves. That could be a role of a facilitator who can come in and try to make that a more equitable conversation. Not that the mediator says it's, uh, I come from a sports background, and so I think about a referee, and back to hockey, <laughs> that uh, if, if you have a good referee, you don't see them in the game, um, and that the game plays. And so it is the parties that are the ones who create the space to make things happen. Very, very quickly as a follow-on and, and, and a brief answer, please. You, you didn't represent the Lakota community in, in Holy Elk has spoken you know, eloquently about you know, that perspective. What can you tell us, because they're not here, about the, the uh, feelings in the law enforcement community, and there were lots of them on the other side. I mean, what were their concerns in this conflict? Mm. Um. As somebody who is in the middle, and just like I cannot speak for Lakota people or those who are at camp, I cannot speak for law enforcement either. And I know that sounds like a dodge from a question, but I must. Um, I cannot speak for them. And I think the biggest lessons are this um, bringing people together for those moments um, as camp closed, trying to find how, and, and this was led by those um, who had much more wisdom than I, um, for them to say, how do we move forward for this next three hours? Um, yeah. Okay. Well, we'll cross the ocean and, and, and go to, to Norway. Elisabeth Gamel Setter, uh, you do not represent the Nusir company, but rather the mining industry as a whole. And Norway seems a lot calmer, at least at this point, on, on uh, the copper mine proposal. Norway is an early signatory to the UN declaration. It has a careful process to accommodate, that's intended to accommodate the rights of the Sami population, and yet you say this process has become something of a procedural quagmire, going back and forth, lacking uh, clarity for your side. How could you improve Norway to enable a peaceful resolution between what you're trying to do, which is mine copper, in a land where the copper is, as you say. It's not anywhere else. You can't go somewhere else for it. And uh, accommodate the concerns of the indigenous communities and uh, environmental associations that are allied with them. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that I think the two cases are vastly different. What I hear about Standing Rock tells me that indigenous people are still vulnerable. Uh, but uh, these two cases are set, they have different implications. They are set in different political systems with different policies. Kvalsun, <clears throat> where the copper mine in the, we're talking about is uh, planned, is an example of a Sami community uh, with a declining and aging population. The mine has strong local support. The mayor tells me it can bring new optimism and growth, and the ground owner argues that uh, the mining uh, project will help safeguard the Sami culture and language uh, locally. Norway has among the world's most strict regulations on uh, environment, health and safety, but also, as you mentioned, we have rules on how to take into account Sami purposes. Copper is a key component in the green technology uh, department. As you said, uh, one big challenge uh, for us is the procedural quagmire or the socks behandlings in Norwegian. Uh, this, uh, that uh, this project has happened in, it goes back and forth, and I believe it's an unworthy strategy. The Sami parliament did not accept the Norwegian uh, Mineral Act. As far as I understand it, this is about uh, three things. It's about indigenous economical compensation, it's about Samis living outside Finnmark, and it's about consultation. And as an industry, we don't have any problems with this. In fact, I invite to a discussion how these issues can be implemented in the Mineral Act, 
And I believe we have a common interest in that we both need the predictability of a clear act. My hope would be to use this debate to address these challenges and to forward them to Norwegian politicians. Uh, yes. We'll go then to the, the obvious response uh, that we will look for from the president of the Sami parliament, Aili Keskitalu. Um, a number of questions implicit there. You were saying that you, like the mining industry, are looking for clarity, but that means something very different for you. <coughs> Well, we certainly want to change the Mineral Act of Norway, uh, but I'm not sure that we want the same changes as, as the mineral industry. Uh, but first, I would like to say that uh, also the matter of uh, Standing Rock and the North uh, Dakota Access P Pipeline is a matter of solidarity for the Sami people. So we recognize your struggles, and your struggles are also our struggles. Uh, and we hope to move forward together. Uh, I would like to say that the uh, copper mining in Nusir area, in uh, Falesnuri, uh, in, in, in Finnmark, is, uh, we are opposing strongly the project uh, of several reasons, where the most important are the disposal of mining waste into the fjord, where uh, the fish, uh, fisheries are, and also because it uh, is kind of a land grab of reindeer herding areas. And I feel very strongly about this uh, because in the same area, uh, the state of Norway, Norwegian authorities, they claim there are too many reindeers there, not enough uh, grazing lands for all the reindeers. But they are allowing land grabbing in the same area. Uh, last week, a young uh, man from one of the reindeer herding districts uh, that are, uh, are having trouble with the Nusir mine, uh, he was in the Supreme Court of Norway, here in Oslo, defending his right uh, to continue his reindeer herding because the authorities are saying to him that he has to slaughter most of his herd because there are not enough land for him. How can the same authorities allow continual land grabbing in, in reindeer herding areas when they are telling us that there is no room for our reindeer herds of today. It makes no sense to me. And, and I, we oppose it strongly. So it, sometimes it seems like a big conspiracy. They are attacking us from different angles. But what gives me hope is that we are still here. We are still here. After hundreds of years of assimilation policies, we are still here. And when it comes to uh, the community of Kvalsun, uh, and the claims that the copper mining will, uh, will make uh, the Sami language and culture blossom in this sea Sami community, and I ask you, show me one indigenous community where mining has, been, uh, uh, has made uh, the cult indigenous culture and language blossom. Give me one example of that. I have tried to research it. Let me ask you a question. Specifically, I mean, you, you speak in protection of traditional occupations of of Sami reindeer um, husbandry, for example. Uh, what is your response to the mayor who was referred to earlier, who talked about the fact that the economy of this region has really dwindled in, in recent decades? Um, is economic development a priority, and how would you like to see economic development come to the region? Well, I, I'm not sure is if, it, if it's true, because the Hammerfest area is the region where oil and, the oil and gas industry are booming in Finnmark. And this is the neighboring uh, village. So I don't, I don't think it's, it's quite true. And the un, un, unemployment rate in this community is minimal. 
So if if uh, this community where to where to where should all the the workers come from? They will, will would have to fl fly them in from other parts of the world to work the mine. So I I don't think it's true that it's the local community and the Sami culture and the, and the Sami language which will benefit. Uh, from uh, from uh, from the, this project, uh, and I would have to say that if Falesnori Suokan Kvalsun Kommune, if they really wanted to fight for Sami language and cu culture, why did they refuse to join the administrative area of Sami language? They didn't want to join up with other Sami communities to protect the Sami language. It's, it's difficult to, to me, for me to understand. Okay. Can, you, can we just get... No, get um, go ahead, no, very we briefly. Were, we were included in the response that you gave, so I just want to respond to that as well. Um, that the, 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 you explained that we were different than the Sami, and, and I want to just let you know that we are not. We are not any different. We stand in solidarity with the Samis against mining companies, against oil industries, because we are the same. We have experienced the same genocide. We still live in the present day genocide that is going on. And they are not, they are in a very vulnerable indigenous people. And, and you are actively trying to make them extinct. So the Lakota people, we stand in solidarity with them because we are the same. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. I feel compelled to give you a very brief response because, but I don't want to go back and forth too much and then I want to get to Professor Ravna quickly, but go ahead. Okay, um, very shortly, uh, we're not trying to make them ex extinct. Um, mining as such was, uh, uh, in some areas was, was challenged here. We are in, uh, not in the backyard, uh, not in my backyard business, but we need the minerals and copper is necessary for the green trans transition, for electrification, etc. Um, Hammerfest was mentioned. Yes, Hammerfest has seen a very positive uh, um, uh, development and Kvalsun living next to Hammerfest is looking for a, a similar uh, development and sees the mine as a possibility for that. Uh, let me answer the question about deposition in the fjord shortly. Because um, uh, when you take out a mineral like copper, there's some re residual and you need to put it somewhere. And this has been decided putting in the fjord, uh, safely on the bottom of the fjord. It's uh, in this particular project, it's been considered that this is the best and least polluting option. And, and there's been, they have been through a very uh, thorough environmental impact association. The deposition is safe, the copper minerals will stay, uh, will be st stable, they will be encapsulated by natural deposition. This particular ore of copper is among the cleanest ones in the world. Sea deposition has been tried locally before, and life has come back. Also, there's substantial knowledge about it based on several decades of such uh, practice in Norwegian mines. And just recently, uh, an EU technical working group acknowledged that Norway is doing this in, in a knowledgeable way. So. I want to go finally on this panel for this round uh, to Professor Oyvind Dravna. Um, you're a legal scholar on indigenous affairs. You are in the University of Tromsø, but you've also spent time in Indian country in, in the upper Great Plains of the United States. You were in Standing Rock. Um, before getting to commonalities that you see between these two conflicts and where you might see opportunity for some coming together and crossing the divide, I wonder if you can reconcile some of what we've been hearing in the dispute in uh, you know, in the, in the Kvalsund um, project. I can say, uh, uh, yes, thank you for the question. And I can say something uh, about, uh, about the mining industry there. Uh, from a legal aspect, uh, there is 
of course, this contradiction to the, between the Norwegian Mining Act and the Sami people. There is a, a few very important points is the benefit to the indigenous people, which is not ensured in the Norwegian Mineral Act. There is not a consistent consultation procedures. And when we go out of the Finnmark area, it's not that sure anything of indigenous people elsewhere in the country. And, uh, and of course, what is uh, very much into focus now, it is the pasture of the reindeer herders. As the uh, Aili Keskitalo, the Sami president, told us there was a Supreme Court case just a week ago where a young reindeer herder had to defend his land because the authorities has a program to reduce numbers of reindeers. Uh, for sure, we cannot compare it in the way the American, the white Americans reduce the quantity of buffaloes on the prairie, but in any case, it is a method to decrease the, the, the level of reindeer for the indigenous people. So at the same time, the argument that, that they should take more and more land for, for the for, for mining industry, it, it, it doesn't fit, it's not as sustainable. Uh, development. Do you see room for an accommodation? Where do you see this proposal going in the next few months? It's likely to be approved by the Norwegian authorities, is that correct? Yeah, usually in Norway, it's the Norwegian state and the government who has the last word. So uh, we, uh, the Norwegian state invite the Sami people to consultation. There is adopted a consultation agreement in 2005, which is rather good or was rather good at that time. But there have been a development uh, for 12 years after that. In 2007, Norway endorsed the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, who say that the international standard in such cases is not consultation, but consent. And uh, there have also been a a uh, law group who has presented a bill for consultation who say that, uh, that uh, the standards should be consent. So there is a time for Norway also to uh, go further when it comes to dealing with the indigenous people and to, uh, to um, involve them in the decision-making process, not just uh, inform them and tell them and ask them to come to the table and say, if we are not agree, we have the last word. Okay. I just want to take us beyond these two, two broader concepts here. Uh, Dr. Menchu earlier mentioned the uh, spectacle of electric lines, electric grid lines coming out of indigenous lands and hydroelectric power going past the communities and not providing electricity um, for the local communities. Are there scenarios in which um, the, the benefits can be more equitably shared. And is that an issue? Is it an issue of cultural preservation as well as an equitable sharing of whatever bounty is being sought? I'll ask you that question. I'd, I, I'd like anyone else to also weigh in, especially uh, you, Chief Ed John. But I mean, is, is that an issue? Is, is it the, the bounty sharing that has not been equitable through history, and is it still perceived as being inequitable? Uh, and is that an issue? Yes, that's a cardinal point in the Mineral Act. Who should have a part of the profit? Should it go to the landowner, or should it go to the indigenous people who have their uh, traditional lands in the uh, area? Uh, the Nor Norwegian Mineral Act, uh, they are not in conform with ILO 169, who say that indigenous people should benefit. But the Norwegian state, they defend themselves, saying they give it to the landowner, and the landowner should provide it further to the indigenous people. But in fact, we see that is not happened. So, so that's a, it's, it's a main issue where the benefit from the industry should go. Right. Where would you like? like to see the benefits um, distributed that would be more equitable in your mind, Madam well, President. Well, 
That is maybe not uh, the most important question for us at this time, because the most important question for us would be able to give a consent or not in the question of if there should be established mining on Sami territory. Uh, that is the most important issue for us, right. to be able to participate in the decision-making process. Uh, so any benefit sharing, that would be step two, three, four, five, uh, further down the line. We want a say in whether a mine should be established or not. And do you see procedurally this, this evolving in, in, in this particular case? Uh, well, uh, we uh, said no to the Mineral Act of Norway. I believe it was in 2006 or 2007. Uh, and uh, that's 10 years with the so-called Saksbehandlingshengemyra uh, that uh, Elisabeth explained about. Uh, we ho are hoping to explain to both Norwegian authorities and also to the mineral uh, industry that uh, this is the mother problem, the biggest problem. We haven't agreed on the legal framework and we will not uh, agree on the legal framework before we have a right to consent or not to the mining. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, one day uh, the Norwegian authorities will recognize this and address it in a proper way. And uh, uh, we are, have been invited to, uh, uh, to the ministry, ministry tomorrow that are dealing with the mineral industry. So maybe that's kind of a signal. Okay. Chief, um, Chief John, you have talked about um, Canada being at the forefront. I mean, what we're talking about are, are systems in place, but the devil is in the details and the implementation, and there seems to be uh, a great scarcity of examples of where uh, the implementation of some of these elegant declarations have, has actually blossomed. Uh, talk about what Canada is doing that gives you hope. The president here, I, I think, rightly pointed out what I think is the essence of what, what, what is needed here. Uh, Sixty years ago, Lester Pearson, who was then the Prime Minister of Canada, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize here. Um, in his speech, he talked about the four phases of peace. And in one of these, he talked about uh, peace and power. Now, let me phrase it within the context of what we're, we're, we are talking about here. Um, Article 43 of the Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, speaks about the 46 standards are the minimum standards for the survival, dignity, and well-being of the world's indigenous peoples. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it is, it is the purpose of the Declaration, after all. So when I come back to the question of peace and power, um, the notion of free, prior, and informed consent is an embedded in at least 17 provisions of the Declaration. And so it's about decision-making. Free, prior, and informed consent is about the ability of indigenous peoples to make decisions about their lands and their territories and resources. And in the Declaration, it also says that where development is to take place in indigenous lands, that the, the state must consult and cooperate with indigenous peoples to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, so how do, you, how do you make that work? How does, so, so that's the point. I'm, that's the point is, it's about a decision-making process. It's not about consultation. Consultation is an old standard where you take a piece of paper and wave it under the indigenous people's nose and proceed with the project. So here you have the, the Sami parliament making decisions on behalf of the Sami people, and you have the state of Norway, the government, making decisions on behalf of the, the Norwegian people. Now what happens if there's a conflict? How do you resolve that? As governments, these need to be, as you said, you were having discussions this week. So in Canada, what, what we have undertaken uh, we have a constitutional provision that recognizes and affirms our rights. In 1982, 
We've been in the Supreme Court of Canada and the courts in Canada over 200 times to find what those 17 words in the Constitution mean. And, and finally, the, the courts have got to the point that consent is a very important issue where, there's, where um, there are deep impacts that are taking place. And I can't think of anything more important than when you're impacting on the rights of Indigenous peoples. So what we have done with the government of Canada and the provincial government where I come from is that they have accepted the declaration to implement in collaboration with us. We're reviewing the environmental process. We're reviewing the federal national uh, legislation on the National Energy Board for pipelines, interprovincial pipelines. We're reviewing the Environmental Assessment Act in Canada. We're reviewing federal legislation on fisheries, that's important here. And we're reviewing federal legislation on navigable waters, but with our involvement in the process. And so what we talk about is co-developing legislation, not for the government simply to talk to us and then proceed as they wish. Uh, the standards are changing and the government of Canada under this prime minister, and we have a minister of justice, uh, an Aboriginal woman from the western part where I come from, we're absolutely proud of her. Her name is Judy wilson Raybo. Uh, she's in this very incredibly important place where she has been able to educate uh, those who are members of parliament. And so here's one of the really big issues is that there's either racism that exists or intolerance, and at the very best you can count indifference. People simply don't care. So we have to become our own advocates. Okay, so you've seen some hint of political will move in Canada where you actually might see some implementation. We have, did I say very little time? We're almost out of it. So I wanna offer each of the panelists maybe 30 seconds to sum up and hopefully with an optimistic note on where you see the political will to start crossing the divide. Go Before ahead. Starting this end? Okay, uh, about uh, um, sharing uh, benefits, I think we have suggested giving it to the Sami parliament, so if that would be a help. Let me also comment on the free informed prior consent. Uh, free is fine, prior is fine, informed is fine. When it comes to consent, as much as far as you can go. Uh, and it should be uh, in, uh, everything should be in consideration. But I uh, respect a no when the government has said that the mining project is not good enough. And, and as long as the other considerations have been taken into uh, being considered, I think that we should uh, also respect, yes, because copper is necessary. We need it for electrification, for bringing people out of poverty. So uh, mining has a, a role and indigenous people have a role and uh, we want to be present at the same time and that's where the discussion uh, should go along. How can we both be present at the same time? Professor, what can stimulate that political will to start walking down and crossing that divide. Yeah, for me also, uh, free prior and informed consent is important. And opposite Elizabeth, I think the only important word there is consent. <laughs> and uh, and uh, if you are speaking about the individual, if a weaker party say no, she have rights to say no. That's a big focus on that everywhere. It should be the same if it's in a, it's a minority culture protecting their land say no against intervention. For me, it's a little bit surprised that this should be that kind of a big discussion. It's obvious that you should have rights to say no when somebody intervent in your land. Thank Despite you. the asymmetry of the power equation, obviously. Yeah, it's of course a question what kind of where the intervention is done, but if it's in the heart of your uh, mother land or your traditional land or, or as in, in, in US or in the Lakota land, the tribal land, you should have rights to say no. Okay. President Cascatello. Uh, well, uh, we are fighting for our future uh, as a people and for some kind of uh, uh, control of our fate. So, so this is important to us and we will continue the struggle 
uh, we are willing to uh, uh, consult with uh, the authorities on, uh, on, in Norway on a better mineral act for the future uh, that will give us the possibility to, to give consent when, uh, when that is uh, in, in question. Uh, but I think uh, uh, for the Nusit case, uh, we would probably not have given consent if we were able to. Uh, and uh, uh, that is uh, our, our position when it comes to the, uh, the Nusir, uh, Nusir mining. Uh, what gives me hope for the future is, of course, that uh, uh, the mineral resources, uh, they are in the ground, they are not going anywhere, and they can, give it, uh, they can be in the ground for several generations uh, forward if we do not have an acceptable legal framework, if we do not have the right technology uh, to, to, uh, to extract it uh, uh, without uh, destroying the environment. So, so I'm, uh, in that case, optimistic uh, for, for the future. We are not in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Chief, 30 seconds. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand that indigenous people are not opposed to development of resources. It needs to be sustainable for sure. Um, it's a lot of times it's where the development is going to take place and the magnitude of that development, how it impacts. So here's a situation as I see. Um, we have a Sami parliament that makes decisions. We have the Norwegian government that makes decisions. So if, for example, uh, Canada makes a decision and we, our own nations make decisions, uh, a lot of people expect that uh, the government decision and respect it if it's yes or no. But when indigenous governments, like the Sami parliament, for example, makes a decision, then people say, what gives you the right to make that decision? Um, and that's really the, the incredible challenge, and we fought for a long time at the United Nations to establish these standards that allows us to make decisions about our respective lands, territories, and resources. And, and I think that's, you know, that there's a hope there that, 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 that collaboration will take place. And let me quote, let me quote um, uh, Justice uh, Rosalie Abella here about human rights. She noted the distinction between, um, in many ways, we are at a crossroads in human rights justice. And the choices we make will determine that not only how history will judge us, but also what kind of world we will live on. Civil rights is about treating everyone the same. Human rights is about acknowledging people's differences so they can be treated as equals. And then she said at the end, uh, indifference, is injustice, is incubator. It's not what you stand for, but it's what you stand up for. And then we must never forget how the world looks to those who are vulnerable. And I would, I would put the indigenous peoples in that category of vulnerability in relation to the power asymmetry that you talk about. So these standards at the UN Declaration are an important balancing mechanism for indigenous people, state relations. That's how we cross the divide, or that's how we look, should look at the divide, that, the topic here. Okay, Stephanie, what gives you hope in 30 seconds? <laughs> yes. <Or less. laughs> well, you've seen a beautiful snapshot of what it means to have dialogue and people in the room together who have difference of opinions and trying to move it forward. Um, but this is on the legal frame. Many of these questions are about how will things play out in court? How will it play out in government? What happens on the sideline, though, with people who are grassroots who are living this when people come in, when law enforcement come in? One of the things that gives me hope is a, a conversation that hopefully will continue about how do we protect those who are in a spot of medical, who are assisting those when there's a frontline action, um, and uh, who protects the media? Um, are they able to go and can they report? Um, many things about Standing Rock did not get reported for many months until there were injuries. 
Um, and so how, do, how is their voice before that happens and how are the, the reporters allowed to come in to share that message with the world? So creating a, a framework for keeping medical media ministry, we'll keep the M's going, mediation, legal observers, those who are coming in in the neutral space to help keep that safe while it works out through the court system. And so I'm hopeful for that as well. Okay, Holyoke. Okay. There are many things uh, that, that would cross the divide, but uh, at the very foundation of it, um, the American government needs to recognize that we are a sovereign people. We are capable, we are intelligent, we are um, entitled to be who we are, and, it, and it's time for them to acknowledge us as such. We are a nation within what they call their country. And it's time for them to honor the, the, the laws that they've created. It's time for them to honor the treaties that they've written and the promises that they've written on those papers. Very good. I think. Chief, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned and cited Justice Abella on indifference being the incubator of injustice, and a good part of that might well be the fact that these issues and these stories are not widely reported, uh, either of them in the major population centers. There, uh, I was told that, that the Nusir controversy is hardly reported um, or visible in the Oslo area, and the Dakota conflict was not very widely reported until it really escalated and I take some responsibility for that as a, as a media person. And so I'm especially thankful to the Nobel folks for raising or helping raise the visibility of this issue in the grand tradition of this institution. And I want to thank all of you for your time, uh, as little as it was. And uh, thank you, Dr. Minshew. Thank you so much for coming. And this dialogue will continue tomorrow as well.